Okay. Well, welcome everyone to today's webinar. I'm hoping you can see everything correctly here. I think we're all set. Um, so welcome to the uh, to the vast modernize your data protection before it's too late webinar. I'd like to thank everyone who is joining us here live, as well as those of you who might be listening to this later. Um, as you probably gathered from the title, we're here to talk about an increased awareness of the challenges we face in data protection and protecting your critical information today and talk about ways we help you modernize your environment and that solution. Because the last thing you wanna do is tell your boss that that really big and expensive data protection solution you deployed today is designed to back up data, but not restore it. Because right? that's ultimately what we have to be able to do is recover that data when you need it the most. So joining me today to help walk through some of the challenges you see out there, as well as some of the solutions that we here at VAST think will make a big difference in your environment are Jason Hammonds, the VP of Field Engineering, and Billy Crafton, Senior Director of Systems Engineering here at VAST. Both Jason and Billy are seasoned veterans in the data and storage, sorry, the storage and data protection field, and are here to share their insights from they gather from the customers, as well as their broad experience across the, the years here. Um, and really the focus around this, for those people who are listening to us, is to help introduce you to both our VAST data's universal storage platform, which I have to believe you probably are hearing about for the first time for a lot of people on the phone, but also to want to go through these challenges that are out there that we're seeing. The reality is there are a lot of various things that people talk about. Obviously, the big one we're going to hear a lot about today, as well as you're hearing out there in the industry, is ransomware. Before we dive into those challenges, though, we want to give you a little bit of the architecture of what VAST is. We're not going to spend a lot of time doing a lot of detail around that, but we want to make sure you're familiar with our solution as it does directly support our vision of what a modernized data protection solution looks like. So to walk you through the VAST universal storage solution, I'm going to turn it over to Jason. Jason? Thank you very much, Jeff. <clears throat> so <clears throat> um, I wanted to talk a little bit about our perspective on the market today because I think a lot of storage companies have tried to do this. They've tried to make flash so inexpensive that it completely replaces disk. You'll hear that theme over and over again. And that's certainly our biggest goal uh, behind how we are in have engineered this architecture and what we believe we can actually do. So what, how do we build this architecture? Um, our overall aim is to bring down the cost of flash to the price of spinning disk. Now, as I said, this, is, has, this has been tried many, many times, but we're seeing in the age of AI and, and modernizing applications and modernizing backup, providing fast access to all of your data is hugely important. And if we can build something that's cost competitive with hard disk, why would customers buy anything else? Uh, flash drives don't break like hard drives do. The latency is better. The IOPS are better. The throughput's better. Everything just improves massively by orders of magnitude. And we'll talk a little bit more about that later. Uh, but our assessment overall is customers have been living with hard drives simply because of cost. So breaking those trade-offs is hugely important with this architecture. And I'll talk about that here a little bit more. Next slide, please. So we are a composable software-defined architecture. We sit in that new modern class, and this allows us to use the latest commodity hardware to remain at the front of that innovation curve. We aren't just doing lift and shift over and over again with the way that we're using hardware. We're allowing customers a lot more flexibility and freedom uh, to, to use the latest and greatest and keep driving those costs down while pushing performance up. In this case, today, we're using the latest QLC drives, storage class memory, and high-speed networking using NVMe over fabrics. Tomorrow, will our adoption of newer hardware technologies uh, will, will happen much, much more quickly than uh, a lot of the competition due to the, the architecture and the software capability that we bring. Next slide. So <clears throat> let's start with QLC. We use it very differently, and this has been in the market for some time. Essentially, we built a global flash controller and software that allows us to write in very friendly one gig chunks and shape writes in a way that extends the life of these drives to 10 years. That's very important because that allows customers to do uh, a lot more in terms of uh, using these, these fast flash architectures over a much longer period of time without being forced into this lift and shift model. Uh, taking advantage of the latest QLC allows us to 
uh, give you that significant raw cost advantage. Now, additionally to that, our clusters use N plus four coding to reconstruct data from a lost drive. And the importance of that is we're just using one fourth of the data, therefore one fourth of the IOs. And uh, when, you, when you compare it to a conventional erasure coding scheme. Now, most storage systems would use something like Reed Solomon. And this says, when something fails, you have to read from the rest of the failure domain and do a recovery. And that's hugely inefficient. The time to recover also grows geometrically. So when something fails on VAST, you don't have to read all of your data. Recoveries are very fast and the architecture is much more resilient at scale. And you can imagine a kind of a right back cache. It's about hundred times bigger than your classic storage system. This gives us enough space to index all of the data down to a byte level. This is hugely important in the way that we use storage class memory in this architecture. It allows us to deliver better deduplication and compression without impacting performance and without limiting system utilization, which is a classical problem with other shared nothing architectures. The real savings in addition to this uh, is a new type of data reduction we call similarity. As data comes in and hits the storage class memory buffer, the application gets an acknowledgement back that the write has been completed. So you get nice latency that's all flash, um, but we, and, and therefore we write at the speed of storage class memory. Uh, and of course, that allows us to fingerprint the data in that, in that storage class memory buffer and create a massive index that allows us to do things that other storage vendors simply can't do with data reduction. Next slide, please. So we've challenged the idea that clusters need to be built with the storage node concept that you see in shared nothing architectures. We've built a new architecture where all of our software is containerized. Thanks to the NVMe fabric, every container you see in the SSDs inside the cluster, you can access without having to talk to any other container. And that's hugely important. Uh, this allows us better scale by allowing the CPUs to incrementally express a single namespace without having to talk to each other. So to get better resilience, because when one node fails, you don't care because there's no state in it. To get better cost, because if you're building an archive, you don't need a CPU per every SSD like you do with shared nothing systems. There's more about the shared everything architecture on our website and a nice comparison to shared nothing. We won't get into great detail about that today, but this fundamental change in how we've built this architecture from the ground up allows us to do things with data protection that other shared nothing platforms simply can't do. And with that, I'll turn it back over to Jeff. Thank you, Jason. Appreciate that. Um, so, you know, the, the whole intent of going through kind of the architecture at a very high level is to help you as the attendees here understand that we've taken a different approach to storage. And the reason that matters in the data protection space is if you look at kind of where things have gone historically, you know, you started with tape, which large sequential writes, which was very good at reads, but the problem was accessing that data was time consuming, right? So then you think about how it moved forward to the purpose-built backup appliances, which are spinning disk with deduplicated data on them. Again, that solved the problem of actually the, the writes as well as reads. But the problem is as you start to actually look at what use cases have started to develop today, those purpose-built spinning disk deduplicated data appliances are creating challenges when it comes to recoveries. And why? Well, it's all because of this digital pandemic. Oh, Jason, I apologize. You have one more slide, but we're gonna tie it together here. I have one more slide and it's worth mentioning. We did an announcement late last year uh, about some uh, a, a huge swath of new features that we have, lo have launched to support uh, our data protection strategy. One of those is ransomware protection. Uh, we can all, of course, happy to do a one-on-one -on -one session with you and go into great detail about how this works. But essentially, uh, this gives you indestructible snapshots that the administrator can't touch and he has to work with vast support uh, to be able to access. And this makes it uh, very easy to mask these recoverable snapshots from any attacker that might compromise an administrator's account. 
And so the reason that matters is that we're talking about here is that that digital pandemic concept here, which is what's going on out there, right? So these all things obviously tie together in terms of what we're trying to focus on here. And really the reason you have to think about starting to modernize your data protection solution. So a couple of key data points, you've probably seen them out there because it, it's getting pretty wide traction. And obviously the concept in talking about ransomware, we're not gonna spend, we're not gonna beat you over the head with the idea of ransomware, but the fact of the matter is it's a matter, it's a question of not when or not if, but when you're gonna have an attack, right? And when you look at this slide, the most important data point in our interpretation is that last one, which is how long it takes you to recover from an attack. Ideally, you're not paying the ransom. So you're looking at your backup solution as kind of that, that stop gap, that last line of defense to be able to recover from your environment or recover that critical data back. And if it's taking you 22 days to get back up and running, and by the way, that's the average. I have personally worked with customers who have taken weeks, if not months, to get back some of the most critical data. So we know that, yes, there's some that customers who have planned for and are ready for this, other customers who are not, and you see this long recovery time associated with that. And to give a couple more data points around that, if you think about kind of where things are happening, all of these come from the same source on, on cloudwards.net. So this is all public data. No, we're not nothing we're creating here, right? You'll be able to understand these things, but you can look across kind of the where the ransomware attacks are happening. Clearly the Americas are big, but also you're starting to see now in EMEA, a lot of attacks happening as well. And then in terms of how people are recovering from that, that top graph there, what you see is a lot of customers are paying the ransom, right? Or victims is probably a better way to put that. That's not ideal, right? Because that just encourages the attackers to continue because obviously they make money, they decide to go after it more and more and more and it perpetuates that problem. So now you're looking at the, actually that other big chunk of there who are recovering 52% of that data um, from backup and recovery. How do you do that? So. If you are looking at your environment today and you're looking at it and say, hey, you, you've got a large deduplicated spinning disk environment, we are here to talk about how you can help solve some of those problems. Billy, before I go on, is there anything you want to add to these slides? I know you've got a lot of experience out there in terms of working with customers and talking through these things. So I'm going to give you a chance to chime in here. Yeah, I'd say that probably the biggest thing is that ransomware has become a business. It's a huge business. Um, you have uh, essentially companies out there that provide 24 by 7 by 365 support for individuals who want to use their software to try and breach someone and, and create some sort of a ransomware situation. You also have individuals that just specialize in breaking into a corporate environment, and then they sell that access off to the highest bidder. And with a lot of the tensions that are going on right now, the... Uh, number of ransomware attacks is obviously increasing. So if you look at what's happening with uh, the way they would normally get in, it's usually through either a phishing attack or someone goes through and downloads some software. With COVID, the number of ransomware attacks and the access became much easier for a lot of the, the ransomware hackers because now there were either people working from home or contractors or using their own computers at home that may not have been hardened uh, against different attacks. And once someone gets into the environment, what they'll typically do is they'll find a weak point, one of the servers that may have not had a, a recent security update. Once they can get into that environment, they can then start uh, trying random attacks to try and compromise login credentials. And that's really what they try to do is they try to get into the Active Directory environment. And once they've accessed that and they have the, the keys to the kingdom, so to speak, they can then look and see what type of backup software you're running, what type of storage you're using, and every vendor has information on their storage out on the web. So anyone can go out there and they can look at your snapshots. They can look at um, basic commands, especially if someone hasn't changed the passwords for their logins for the backup software, if they're doing something different. So what we find typically in ransomware attacks is that they're going in, they'll get into the environment, they will go ahead and start trying to pull data off of the environment slowly. So they'll siphon the data off so that they can then try to blackmail the company if they choose not to pay the ransom to get their data back. At that point, they may start a slow encryption process. Now, a lot of the backup applications can monitor for this as well, and you'll start seeing uh, decreased data reduction numbers if you have a, an application like Convolve that dedupes extremely well. So there are a couple of different methodologies that you can do. One is you can look and see if your data reduction numbers have uh, decreased. Uh, Commvault has some uh, latest updates. We'll go ahead and 
try to give you alerts if it sees something um, strange in the environment. There's a lot of software packages that can help you identify or protect servers. But I know that we've got a slide coming up, and I'll give an example, a real world example of what happens with a ransomware attack. Great, thanks. So, you know, one of the things that I, I've heard recently is ultimately the attackers only have to be successful once. Whereas if you're trying to play defense, you have to be successful 100% of the time, right? So what it comes down to is the idea that you can spend a lot of time and effort trying to secure your environment. And obviously there are some basic things that customers should be doing out there to secure their environment, their data and their, their networks. But a really persistent attacker is going to get through eventually, right? Which is why, again, it's a question or it's not a question of if, but more a question of when. So, you know, the other thing I've heard recently, Billy, and I'd like to get your perspective on this, right? The only reason you back up is to restore. And I say that in the, in the context of the, again, these deduplicated data purpose-built appliances on spinning disk were really designed for backup, right? When you talk about the ability to back up, the vendors always focus on how much data and how much time do you have to back up that data in. They rarely, if ever, talk about how much time and how much data you had to recover, right? Those systems were really great at recovering an individual file, an individual system, individual database. But in the concept or context of a ransomware attack, if you're going to try and recover hundreds of systems, hundreds of terabytes, petabytes of data in parallel, the argument that I'm going to make is that, hey, if you can't restore that data when you need it the most, why do you even bother backing it up? So I'm curious, Billy, do you, do you agree that the only reason you back up is to restore? Yeah, I disagree with the statement just because I know that backup is also used for legal retention quite a bit. So if you have a long retention of five years or seven years, you're really never going to restore that data. But typically there's a legal reason that you have to keep that data, possibly for a legal discovery uh, at some time down the line. And when you talk about a purpose-built backup appliance, a PBBA, realize that's a purpose-built backup appliance. It's not a purpose-built restore appliance. And uh, a perfect example of that is if you tried to load uh, VMware and put a data store on that appliance, you may experience a very unhappy situation when you can't really do anything with any of the virtual machines that you're trying to use. So whenever I look at uh, backup, um, I do think that there are multiple use cases for backup. If you have it for long retention, then send it to tape, send it off to the cloud, do something with it. Who cares? If you really want to leverage backups for, for what they are there for, which is to recover your environment in case of an outage or in case of some sort of a, a ransomware attack or, or some disaster of that nature, then you have to have something that can restore very quickly. So backups are useless if you can't restore from them, is my basic opinion. <laughs> and um, you know, purpose-built backup appliances were great uh, 20 years ago. I used to be data domain, so I was very proud of that appliance whenever uh, um, we were purchased by EMC way back in the day and, and how well it did. But it's, uh, it's kind of gone the same way as uh, uh, virtual tape libraries. You know, virtual tape sucks. Um, you know, we used to have the, the bumper stickers, tape sucks, virtual tape sucks too. And I would say that purpose-built backup appliances are in that same realm in the sense that they're useless. Uh, people are getting into this situation now where they actually want to use their data versus just storing it or they have to recover it very quickly. And one thing that I find very interesting with uh, VAST and, and Flash technology is that your restore performance is tremendously faster than your backup performance. So if you compare just the normal backup speeds, they're very similar to those uh, PBBAs, you know, those outdated dinosaurs. But whenever you start looking at uh, restore times, if I can increase my, my restore speed by 8X, you know, 7X, and get my data back much faster. I'm actually pushing the data back faster than the source arrays can actually support it. Now, here's something also to be very uh, cognizant of whenever you talk about ransomware attacks. If you have a ransomware encounter and your environment gets hit, realize that you probably will have some sort of insurance requirement or some sort of government forensics requirement that will not allow you to touch that primary storage. So if you cannot access or use your primary storage until someone comes in and looks at the environment, you have to look at uh, your other environments and, and think, okay, how can I get my databases back up? How can I get my um, VMware environment back up? At least with VAST, because we're an extremely high performance, low cost, built-in appliance, 
you could actually run your data store directly off fast. You could run your Oracle database, or you could run your Docker or Kubernetes environment with our uh, uh, Kubernetes CSI driver. So there are a lot of different things that you could do within VAST where you can actually go ahead and run that production environment if you had to in a worst case scenario. Or more importantly, I have some customers that will replicate to a DR site and they don't have a lot of additional storage of the DR site. They're just using one tier. And that's really what we're talking about is the fact that um, with VAST, you can go ahead, back up directly to the platform. You can go ahead and spin up your DR and test environments directly on VAST. You don't have to buy yet another level of storage. You don't have to administer that storage. It makes life a lot easier, especially when you look at the data reduction capabilities. Can I just add to that, Billy? That's a great point. I think that, uh, you know, in addition to that, and I mentioned this earlier, the deduplication and compression that we offer, you know, with, with similarity goes above and beyond what backup vendors can do in terms of the, so the backup software that you're using of choice. But equally, when you are to recover into the same environment, it's a lot more space efficient using our data reduction capabilities and the performance capabilities that we bring as well. Um, very cost efficient and very fast. So to that end, Jason, I'm curious, are, are there things that you've seen over the last you know, five to seven years when you look at the technology related to restores and things, and, and Billy touched on a couple of them already, I, I believe, but things that you're seeing out there that you think vast really does help unlock and, and make that uh, useful for customers versus some things that may not be possible, say, if you were still using tape or if you're using an older you know, backup appliance. I think it's really comes down to how we drive cost out of flash. Uh, it makes, I think, customers much more comfortable about putting backups or even things like database backups from, you know, raw Oracle RMAN dumps to SQL Server dumps to your backup vendor of choice, where you might place that on kind of a tier one type of architecture that you believe is highly resilient um, and very flexible for your DBAs and your backup administrators. We satisfy all of those requirements in terms of resilience and tier one uh, scalability. So uh, the benefit you get is it's much lower cost to do that kind of thing. And of course, as we mentioned earlier, the data reduction techniques that we're using are not impactful to performance. So to Billy's point, it makes recoveries from that same platform much, much easier to sustain without affecting the other workloads. And that's really important. You don't need silos to now uh, uh, you know, make up parts of your recovery plan. It can truly be one platform that has very nice QoS features, but more importantly, uh, all the performance characteristics that will give you, you know, orders of magnitude faster uh, restore speeds than your other backup appliances. Yeah, I think one of the things that really appeals to me when we talk about the vast platform is the fact that it's not, yes, we're talking about it in the context of data protection here, but to your point, it's got all the specification performance of a tier one storage platform, right? So we are, our customers are using this in some of the largest high performance computing environments in the world, right? Running big data, big data and AI queries against this and the performance requirements of those applications are pretty significant. And we're able to meet all those requirements and plus some, but it's also cost effective enough to actually use for your backup in your data protection environment. Because now the concept in my mind of restore is much more important, right? So to be able to recover hundreds of terabytes in parallel from your backup solution is really compelling. That's really, in my mind, the, the key here of, of why it matters and how modernizing your environment with VAST makes sense. But I'm curious, what are some of the other features or functions that customers should be looking at and, and seeking in their data protection solution that should be part of their modernization effort? I'll open that question to either one of you. Anyone wants to jump in? Well, yeah, one thing I want to mention is that uh, there have been some advancements over the last couple of years, especially around NFS and S3. So we see more and more companies starting to leverage S3, either for moving out immutable objects out of databases. So they're taking petabyte databases and moving that in those images that may be stored or, or things that don't change into an S3 repository so they can shrink the size of their databases. Now, if I can take a petabyte database instance and shrink that down to you know half that size or even maybe a quarter of that size, now my management of that database has improved dramatically. A couple of other things is that um, if you look at RDMA over converged Ethernet, we now can provide NVMe type speeds 
at uh, you know sub millisecond response times that you couldn't have done previously. And so if I've got a, a remote server, instead of putting in a lot of expensive NVMe drives into a bunch of servers, I can put a minimal amount of storage, maybe for boot or even do boot over uh, SAN. And from that point, I can go ahead and just point that over to VAST and set up RDMA. So now I've got super fast connection. And anyone who's dealt with large environments, you know that sometimes managing those environments, especially in block devices, can get a little complicated. When you start looking at the, the uh, new stack technology and, and Kubernetes and, and things like that, then that's where VEST really shines because it's designed to handle that newer technology. Whether we're using something called InConnect, which is a, a new feature within Mount that creates multi-streaming, there are a lot of new features that allow us to open up the, the true performance of Flash on the storage array. And VAST is unique in the sense that they have really focused on allowing for those multi uh, connection type methodologies. So whether you're using something like NConnect or we have a driver that you can use or um, really just even high performance S3, those are all things that are they're newer to the market that allows people to um, reduce their administrative effort and uh, expand their environments much easier than what they may have done in the past. Just to add to that, I think that, you know, I've, I've come from other Flash products that have done a great job of delivering performance at lower cost. But one thing that's really blown me away about Vast is just simply the insane read performance that we can supply because of the disaggregated uh, shared everything uh, type of architecture. Uh, it's a huge, huge differentiator for this particular use case where you need to hit a certain price point, obviously, to make it viable, but the restore speeds that we're getting are orders of magnitude 10x, 20x, 30x in some cases uh, higher than even other all flash vendors. And that's an architectural software advantage that I think Fast brings um, as well. So, so one of the things that I, I want, Jason, if you don't mind touching on a little bit as well, is we talk about the, the DAS design here it's very different than the monolithic array type of design customers are typically used to. How does that change the kind of the management infrastructure? And Billy talked a little bit about administrative overhead, but how does that change what a customer or backup admin has to do in terms of integrating VAST with their backup applications today? Well, I mean, in terms of integration, we have a very fast native S3 implementation and we deliver, I think, you know, a very fast REST API experience as well. So gaining insights into uh, all, of, all of your directories and just seeing everything from a simple view and leveraging, I think, all the benefits that we bring with metadata management using storage class memory, that's actually a very significant thing. You'll find other legacy architectures um, that come from a shared nothing background they're limited to how much DRAM is in the system to deliver better metadata performance for those types of things. So with VAST, the REST API experience, for example, is very, very fast. It's very seamless. It's very scalable in terms of uh, the amount of connectivity that you can, that you can use as well. Um, so I think uh, in the way that we're delivering that sort of AWS-like experience on-prem at 10 to 20x the speed, but half the cost, I think is really what customers love. And in the backup world, because backup vendors are adopting S3 so rapidly and using it to integrate with the public cloud, we're riding that adoption curve and bringing up better experience at a lower cost. Um, Billy, is there anything you wanna to add to that? Yeah, there are two things that I was very impressed with uh, with VAST um, whenever I came on board. And uh, like you, I came from a competitor that dealt with all flash appliances. And uh, in your traditional scale out architectures, if you, I'll use like a, a Nutanix as an example. So what they do is whenever you add a node, you're adding both compute and storage. And um, in my previous um, company, we used to laugh that uh, with normal storage, you need a forklift. Whenever you go to hyperconverge, you need a bigger forklift. And uh, you still see that with a lot of the scale out architectures that whenever you scale out and add a node, you're both adding uh, compute for throughput as well as capacity. And that's not always cost effective. So the things that I really liked about the vast architecture is that the throughput and the compute are separate from the storage in the back end. So that's where you'll see the, us talk about uh, C nodes or compute nodes. 
Um, they're just very simple um, boxes to you, boxes to hold four notes, you know, very standard, very easy to use. If I need more throughput, I add more C notes. If I need more capacity, then I add my disc boxes and I can scale those out. And whenever you're looking at a uh, half petabyte or a petabyte into U, it's amazing how dense you can get the architecture. The other thing that I thought was very impressive in the architecture, again, is the resiliency. So I've never seen an architecture where you could have uh, at least a, uh, the ability to lose complete disk box as you grow in capacity. And so with the redundancy that's built in, I can lose multiple compute nodes. As long as I've got one compute node up, I have access. If I have uh, at least nine uh, D boxes, I can lose a full chassis and still maintain operations. You can't do that with other architectures. And that really impressed me as we talk about the scale out universal storage. And the other thing is that um, I had an experience with a customer that was running legacy Oracle environment. A lot of uh, people are very familiar with Oracle. They uh, were running on AIX and there was a slight power outage. The array came right back up within one minute. It, it was a customer issue where they cut power to the wrong rack and brought the entire rack down. The customer was down for a week in all their remote offices because uh, all the AIX mount points went read only and then they had to do consistency checks on the databases. And it just kind of, it reconfirmed for me that this legacy architecture is very fragile. And whenever you start looking at containers and the way they're designed, they're meant to go away and just spin up another container and keep on running. Perfect example with VAST that nobody else does is the fact that since we're running as containers, you can kill these C nodes, who cares? It's gonna move the connection over without any impact to the clients. They won't know that's happening. And when you've got a protocol like SMB and SMB 2.1, where it's not resilient, where if you lose a connection, like if you're using Isilon, if you lose a connection, your customers have to go ahead and reconnect to the storage. With VAST, because everything's built on containers, if we lost a C node, if we're doing a software upgrade, it's not a big deal. We'll just go ahead and move that connection over to the next container. And there's no impact to the end user. But if I'm looking at a lot of the competitive platforms out there, they're old, they're archaic, and they cause a lot of pain from the administrators. And our real goal for the admins is that they shouldn't really care. They shouldn't have to spend a whole lot of effort. Um, if you're spending too much effort on this, then obviously we didn't design it properly. Good, good point, good point. So, so I have a feeling I, we could probably talk all day. <laughs> you guys, with again, your wealth of experience here and the situation you're seeing out there. So before we uh, before we go any further, I'm going to give a pause here and see if there's any questions from the audience, um, anyone who might want to ask something of us. You can add it to the chat or the, the Q&A panel there, and we'll go through that. There, there is one question here that's come through, and I want to just, I think I'm going to throw this to you, Billy, but Jason, feel free to jump in as well. So the question is, if I already have a disaster recovery plan, should I be comfortable that I can recover from ransomware? If you already have a disaster recovery plan, well, let me ask you, if you, your disaster recovery plan means that you're going to rely and assume that your backup software is still available, that your backup platform, there's a big question mark. Are you doing it to an air gap solution? Um, are you doing it to on-prem? Do you have a vault with a sec uh, secondary environment? And I'll, I'll give you an example is that <clears throat> we had a customer with a, a very large customer that was using a um, different uh, backup software and, and, and uh, different backup uh, appliance, a purpose-built backup appliance. And they were doing an air gap solution. So they had their entire environment uh, air gapped over to a, a separate data center. They got hit with a ransomware attack, which brought down their mapping software, you know, which was also supplied to pilots and um, other individuals. And they were down for a complete week and then decided to pay the ransom because you're only as fast as your slowest point. And for them, the pipes to their air gap solution was not uh, large enough to allow them to recover their environment in a timely manner. And they couldn't get their production environment, just their production environment back, their most critical applications back within seven days. So they ended up paying for uh, the ransom. So if I uh, look at another customer, they built a, it's a financial, they built a complete vault uh, with matching servers. So in their situation, their DR plan is that it's, it's air gap, but it's also protected. And um, they use uh, um, a newer software technology to go ahead and recover that environment. But they've got full servers there. And the reason that's kind of important is that a real world experience is we had a customer in Canada that had a ransomware attack. In that situation, what happened was they uh, basically walled off the environment that was infected 
built a brand new network, um, brought in new servers, and uh, they were using backup tape. And it was a smaller environment because they just wanted to get their online environment back up and running. So they went ahead and they restored that environment. And then they thought everything's good. We've deployed our protection software to prevent the malware software from spreading. As soon as they opened up the, uh, the pipe, within five minutes, the entire new environment was infected. And they are looking through it and they're then going through forensics, what happened, what happened. And they discovered that the backup server didn't have the software protection on it. So the, you know, the hacker got in, infected that server, and then he was able to uh, attack the rest of the environment. So they went ahead, shut down the VPN, um, brought everything down, reformatted everything. And this was over 24 hours for each one of these events. So they had to, they basically lost a day recovering that environment. They then rebuilt the environment again, you know, spent 24 hours, uh, got the environment back up and running opened up their pipes and everything got reinfected again. And so they went through and, and found yet one more server that they had missed. So they went ahead and added that. And then they went through, shut down the environment, lost another day, <clears throat> rebuilt the environment, reconnected <clears throat> after they rebuilt it. And they noticed they were getting all these attacks. And they started looking, trying to figure out where these attacks were coming from. And they're looking through all their servers in their data center. And all of a sudden they see some traffic coming from their uh, parking garage. And there was a service uh, system in the parking garage and the hacker was live dialed into and connected into that remote garage. And he was using that to launch his attacks. So it's really interesting whenever you look at, uh, is your plan there? You know, it's, I think Mike Tyson said that, uh, you know, everybody has a plan until they get punched the first time. And then uh, you've got to kind of roll with the punches. And I guess that's my, my comment is you've got to have a very resilient platform. You've got to have a resilient plan and you've got to take into account what happens if I lose everything. How do I get back? Yeah, and I, and my perspective is I think a lot of traditional DR plans are designed for that kind of that smoking hole type of scenario that assumes that I've lost that infrastructure and I have to fail over to my other site. But two things are true there, right? The ransomware if you haven't designed it correctly could easily traverse that network as well. So now both sites are encrypted, but more importantly, once you get hit by ransomware, you're looking at all your infrastructure going, why can't I use this, <laughs> right? It's all still there. It's just encrypted and you know can't be used. That's where the recovery aspect really does start to play into it. And you're right. If you're trying to pull stuff back across small pipes or an air gap solution, it's going to be really challenging to get things back up and running. And that's really when being a backup admin really is a terrible job <laughs> because everyone's staring at you. And if you haven't thought about the ability or the need to recover that data quickly from your backup solution, you're going to be in a lot of a lot of attention and a lot of pain at that situation, uh, as Billy can attest to from that customer example he gave there. Can I, just, um, can I, just, make, can I just make one comment, please. Jeff? I think those are all great points, and I think the one thing that's worth adding is having that last line of defense with these indestructible snapshots that are hidden from your administrator. Great point. We don't charge for this. It's part of the capacity license, which is follows, I think, a very easy commercial model in doing business with VAST anyway. So you're gonna get it regardless if you uh, feel like you need it or not. It's just built into the system. Why not use it as a last line of defense uh, should your admin administrator be compromised? There's a lot of great uh, ransomware solutions out there from backup vendors. We're not trying to be that. We're trying to be uh, the last line of defense that is rock solid and comes with the platform and uh, you know basically gives you an out if something else goes wrong. Yeah, great point. Great point. Also, we aren't tied to a specific vendor. So if you're using you know, TSM or Spectrum Protect, if you're using that backup, if you're using Commvault, uh, database dumps are obviously very popular among some environments. You know, all those work perfectly fine with uh, with Vast. And then we're working with uh, some newer backup vendors to also integrate a little bit closer with them. But uh, there are certain things there. And uh, one other quick story, Jeff, on ransomware attack. We had a hospital that got impacted with a ransomware attack. And what happened was the uh, hacker breached the environment. He compromised the login credentials. He uh, pulled up the calendar of the primary storage admin. And he could see that the primary storage admin was gonna go on vacation in a few weeks. So what he did was he waited until the storage admin was gone on vacation and then launched his ransomware attack when he had all his backups there and he, he wasn't available. So just be aware that uh, once they get into the environment, they can look at your calendars, they can look at your email, they can figure out what's going on, and they can create different hacks. Um, there's something called uh, um, SIM phone stealing, where they'll still steal your SIM card uh, so they can get past standard two-factor authentication. There are a lot of really interesting things that you have to watch out for um, involving ransomware, especially with the nature of 
what's happening in Europe right now. It's gotten even crazier. Completely agree. Completely agree. Yeah. Well, I don't see any other questions um, in the chat here. So unless you guys have any last words of, of advice or, or comments you want to make before we wrap up? I think if you're looking at how to protect your environment from ransomware, just be aware that if you're relying on snapshot protection and your backup software, whenever the hacker comes in, the first thing they're going to attack is your Active Directory environment. They're going to attack your network switches. They're going to look and see what backup software you are, and they're going to try to destroy it because that's going to be the way that you would recover. And they're going to look at every vendor's arrays that you have out there that you may leverage snapshots. And they're going to try to delete and purge those snapshots. That's all part of a scripted attack that can occur within minutes. And so the, the worst thing you can get is uh, Sunday morning at 2 a.m. and you've got the flashing ransomware sign saying, hey, send me some money. So just be aware that you have to have something that can um, have resiliency, that can provide higher performance restores in some methodology, whether that's going from snapshots or pulling back from your backup software. If you're relying on an air gap solution, realize that you're only as fast as your slowest point and that uh, that's going to have a, a big impact on how quickly you can get your environment back. If you're relying on the cloud as your only solution, then you, know, you may run into some other challenges to see. If you haven't run your entire environment in the cloud, you may not have that capability, or you may turn into a lot more challenges. So uh, I would say that if you're looking at your ransomware uh, protection methodology, just be aware that you need software to deploy to try to detect that ransomware attack and, and uh, basically protect the servers from the various ransomware software. Like uh, Riot was used to be the primary package that was out there in all the variants, and now it's uh, you know Revel has become very popular and is the number one package. I think Revel is number one package because they provide really good support for their hacker community, so that the uh, hackers really don't know a whole lot. Yeah, these are these are not really uh, brilliant scientists that are doing these attacks. These are guys basically just downloading a package and launching it until they find a, a vulnerability. So uh, with all the, the attacks that are occurring out there, then uh, just be aware of it and think of how you can protect your environment if you do lose your credentials. Great. Perfect. Jason, anything else you'd like to add? Yes. So we, Vast as a company, have invested significantly in Europe and the Middle East. We have a, uh, a presence in, in, in really just about every major market. So please book a, book, book a session with us, uh, and we're happy to spend some time with you and uh, bring some examples of where we're changing things uh, in a big way with customers using this shared everything architecture and uh, give you a nice deep dive session. Excellent. With that, I appreciate everyone's attendance and attention today and look forward to hearing from you guys soon. Take care, everybody. Thank you, everyone. Thanks, everyone.